The 2022 version of the Atlanta Braves offense was one of the best in all of baseball, but this year's version will be even better. I'll tell you why on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome back to Lockdown Braves, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also, make sure you check out my website, shortstopball.com. And you can check me out over at Braves Today as well, where I'll be doing all of my writing coverage on the Atlanta Braves for the upcoming season. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. Submit any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. If you're new, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. And if you're watching this video there, please do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button as it does help support the show a ton. And thank you for your support in making Lockdown Braves your first listen of each and every day. We post episodes daily, five days a week, Monday through Friday, and we are free and available on all platforms. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. On this episode, we are going to be previewing the Atlanta Braves offense for the upcoming season and one that I think has the potential to be the best in all of baseball, which it's not like they were bad in 2022, but I think the 2023 version could be even better with several players expected to have better performances than they had in 2022. And I just, I really like the depth of the team as well. Something that I couldn't say coming into spring training, but I've really been impressed with the depth pieces that the Atlanta Braves have. But let's jump into it, talking about the Atlanta Braves offense for 2023. And let's start by looking at 2022. In 2022, the Braves were easily a top five offense in baseball. I think you could say they were a top three offense in all of baseball. They were second in OPS with at 760, only behind the Dodgers. They were second in home runs with 243, only behind the Yankees. They were fourth in doubles with 298. They were first in slugging percentage. They were ninth in on-base percentage and ninth in average as well. I think a lot of times when you think about the Braves offense, you think about all the home runs and the strikeouts, but this team was still top 10 in batting average. So, you know, obviously very strong there as well. Third in WOBA, first in barrel percentage, second in hard hit percentage, and second in average exit velocity. That is the good, and there's a lot of good in there. The Braves hit the ball hard. They hit a lot of home runs, a lot of extra base hits, and that's certainly what you're looking for in today's game. Looking at the bad for the Braves, I don't know this is considered a bad because they were 15th in stolen bases, but they were just in the middle. I think that will improve in 2023. You get a full season of Michael Harris. You get a full healthy season of Ronald Acuna Jr., potentially a full season of Von Grissom as well, and Ozzie Albies. I think the stolen base, I think the Braves could be top 10 in stolen bases as well this upcoming season. Now the bad for the Braves, 19th most walks. I put most in quotation marks there. Um, didn't draw a lot of walks, um, struck out a lot, second most strikeouts in all of baseball. Now, part of that is the fact that the Braves hit the baseball hard, and to do that, you swing hard at just about every pitch you swing at. There's not a lot of two-strike approach. There's no choking up to make contact. Part of that is it leads to a lot of strikeouts, but it also leads to a lot of home runs, and it leads to a lot of runs, and that's why the Braves – are one of the best offenses in all of baseball. So it's just a type of approach, and I get frustrated with it at times, but the results speak for themselves. I just read through you, read to you all of the good for the Braves offense last year, and I think that will continue in 2023. But the reason that I think the offense in 2023 can be even better is there are more players who are expected to improve in 2023 than there are players who are expected to decline and a lot of that is led by Ronald Acuna Jr. We talked a lot about him in the offseason. Says he's fully healthy, ready to go. Seeing him impact the baseball more, get more lift on the baseball. I've said it on here several times throughout the offseason. 
The only real change for Acuna last year, he still hit the baseball hard, but that launch angle, he was not getting that lift on the baseball. It was also a lot more pull as well. We weren't seeing him drive it to the opposite field quite as much, but we see that version of Ron Acuna Jr. getting back where he trusts that knee a little bit more and he's able to get that lift on the baseball. We're going to see him back to an 850, 900 OPS type player. But last year, just a 764 OPS, and I say just a 764 OPS, which would be a solid season for many players, but obviously a down season for Ronald Acuna Jr. Fangrass projects him right now for an 857 OPS, almost a 100-point difference on his OPS from 2022 to 2023. Ozzy Albies as well got out to a slow start last year and then got injured. You know the story there. But a 703 OPS last year projected at a 767 OPS by Fangraphs in 2023. So expecting a big boost for Ozzy Albies and a bounce back year for him now that he is healthy. Matt Olson, um, very good year last year. An 802 OPS in his first season in Atlanta, filling the big shoes of Freddie Freeman, coming over to a new league. And he still was really good, an OPS over 800. And Fangraphs expects him to be much better than that in 2023 with an 842 OPS. So, again, as good as he was last year, I think Matt Olson is ticketed to have an even better season in 2023. And then the next two are kind of obvious because they can't be as bad as they were in 2022, or I certainly hope not. But Eddie Rosario, I mean, the guy couldn't see the baseball. That makes it a little difficult to try and hit. He had a 587 OPS last year. Fangrass projects him at 698 in 2023. I'm going to go out on the limb, though, and say if he's at an OPS below 700, he may lose that job eventually. I think he may be a little bit better than that. Maybe low 700s OPS-wise would be a good bounce-back season for Eddie Rosario, but I do think he at least gets the shot initially in left field. But there are some solid depth pieces behind them, which we're going to talk about later. And then Marcelo Zuna, 687 OPS last year and 470 at bats. It's not like the Braves didn't give this guy a chance. He just didn't come through and didn't come through consistently. I think his, his leash is going to be pretty short in 2023 as well. But I've gone on record, and I think I've been pretty consistent in saying on here multiple times, you give him, you know, 450 to 500 at bats. He's a guy that can hit 25 to 30 home runs. And if he hits 240 with 25 to 30 home runs and 75 to 80 runs batted in and a 750 OPS, somewhere in the mid 700s OPS wise, that's a solid player at your DH position. And you know, I don't want him on the team. I've I've made that very clear, more so because of the offensive side of things, but I think he can still impact a baseball and I think he can still be a positive player. We haven't seen much of that in the past two years, but if he can clear all the off, off the field stuff up and just focus on baseball and being the best version that Marcelo Zuna can be at this point, I think he's capable of having that type of year at the DH position for the Braves, but I, I'm not expecting it. My hopes are, are very low for him in 2023, but Certainly think he's capable of having a much better season than he did a year ago. Now, as far as players who are set to regress, um, three in particular, Michael Harris and Von Grissom, both coming into their first full season. If Von Grissom wins the shortstop job, which we talked about that some yesterday with Braden Shoemake making his entrance into the discussion. But Michael Harris had an 852 OPS last year, winning NL Rookie of the Year. You know, it would be understandable for him to perhaps take a step back in his sophomore season. Maybe he doesn't, but certainly understandable if he does. Fangrass projecting him at a 782 OPS, which is still really good, but they do expect him to take a step back in his first full season. Von Grissom had a 793 OPS. We already kind of saw him decline a little bit later in the season, but they project him for a 734 OPS. Honestly, don't know how either of those guys are going to respond in their first full season. Um, but again, they got off to hot starts in their their rookie campaigns. Would not be surprised if either of them takes a step back. 
And then Travis Darno, um, 791 OPS last year in 2022. Fangrass projects him for a 726 OPS. I could go either way on this. I think Travis Darno is going to see less time behind the plate as a catcher for sure. Uh, I don't think he trade for somebody like Sean Murphy and not have him back there a hundred plus times a year. But does Travis Darno get more at bats in the DH spot? Does you know him catching less? Does that keep him fresher and more healthy in order to be better at the plate when he gets his opportunities? I think that's an unknown right now. But Travis Darno was really good last year. I mean, a 791 OPS for a catcher that is really solid. So even then, if he regresses more to a a 725, 740 OPS type player. That's still really good. So again, we're talking about players who were exponentially great last year, possibly just taking steps back down to the mean a little bit. But overall, the Braves have more players who are set to improve in 2023 than they are to regress, which means this offense could be even better in 2023 next i want to talk about the lineup and the depth and then get to some of your twitter responses as well for players who you think are going to be better than players you think might regress this upcoming season the nba season is coming to a close and you got march madness going on as well so now is the perfect time to download the FanDuel sportsbook app america's number one sportsbook because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com locked on just download the FanDuel sportsbook app it's free it's safe secure and super easy to use and then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores threes drain you can get in on the MLB preseason odds as well plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay so don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more also if you have gambling problems make sure you visit FanDuel.com slash play safe for tools and resources to help you stay in control of the way you play make every moment more with FanDuel an official sports betting partner of the NBA all right getting back into our offensive preview for the 2023 season and quickly wanted to give you my projected lineup now this isn't necessarily the lineup that I would roll out there and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on the lineup and what it should be so put that down in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or hit me up on Twitter if you're watching or you're listening to the podcast but what I think the lineup is going to be, based on what I've seen from Snicker in spring training, is that he's going to put Olsen in the two-hole and, ba and bat Michael Harris further down. I think that's really the only discussion here is, do you put Harris up at the top of the order or more down towards the bottom? I'm fine with starting the year with Harris more towards the middle, bottom portion of the order. Coming into his sophomore season, I'm sure the league's going to be adjusting to him some. He's going to have to make some adjustments back, which I think we saw him do in his first year. I mean, he came out hot, kind of struggled in the second month, and then you know made some adjustments and came back and it was really good. So I don't have too many concerns there, but I understand not wanting to put all that pressure on a young kid in his second season. So perhaps batting him down in the order is the best idea right now to start the season. Now, if he comes out and he's that player again, and he's an 800 OPS player, and that's just who he is, I would rather see him in that two hole and you put Olsen down and more behind Riley uh, in a more run driving in situation. I think that's the optimal lineup for the Braves, but I'm fine with Acuna, Olsen, Riley, Murphy, Harris, Albies, Ozuna, Rosario, and Grissom. I think that's primarily going to be your lineup to start the year. I like having Albies down there. If you are going to bat Harris down in the order, I like putting Albies behind him because if you bring in a lefty to face Harris, which he did struggle against lefties a good bit this year, then you set Albies up to face a lefty, and we know how good he is against lefties. So I like I like having Albies bat behind Michael Harris in the order. But this is what I I would project project right now on opening day, assuming a righty is starting on the mound that day. But let me again, let me know your thoughts on the lineup in the comments below. As far as the depth for the Atlanta Braves, this is one of my biggest concerns coming into the season is their depth on offense, in particular their middle infield depth. And 
I'm really high on this depth now based on what I've seen in spring training. And perhaps it's players who are just going all out because they know their job is on the line. But, you know, I've always felt good about Arcia off the bench, and I still do. I don't think he's a starter, and I think he has not looked great in spring training, didn't look great in the Winter League games that I watched. But I think he's solid as a bench utility guy who can come in and fill a void for somebody's down on the I.L. for a couple of weeks. I like Sam Hilliard. He's been he's been solid in spring training, good left-handed bat. I think Kevin Pillar makes the roster for his veteran leadership, a right-handed bat, defensive replacement late in games. And then Travis Darno you know, will be on the, the bench as well and part of that DH catcher rotation. But down at the minor league level, well, I've talked about Eli White. I, I don't know what else you need to see from him. Uh, I think the only reason he doesn't make the roster out of camp is the fact that he has options left. And Hilliard doesn't, and you kind of just want Pilar there for that veteran presence. I could see them maybe keeping White, and Pilar is on a minor league deal. You could send him to Gwinnett, but that's what I would just project for right now. But Eli White has looked fantastic in spring training, and I think he'll get a shot at some point. But you got to keep in mind, and Mark Bowman tweeted this out the other day as well, the Braves are trying to think about keeping the best players on the team for the entire season not just for March 30th. And it doesn't make sense to DFA a guy in Hilliard who could help you to put White on the roster, who I don't even know if he would start every day. Now, if you thought White was going to be your everyday starting left fielder and he earned that opportunity, then yes. But if you don't, then it just makes sense to roll with the guys who are out of options and stash White in minor leagues until a spot opens up. Opens up. Boris Wall's been great as well. Jordan Luplo, you know, been slowed in spring training. We're just now kind of seeing him, but I think he'll be great depth in the outfield, right-handed bat, DH type bat as well. Chadwick Trump is a solid backup catcher at the minor league level. Adrianza's had a great spring, hit a grand slam on Tuesday, and then we've seen Braden Shoemake, what he has done, elevating himself into that shortstop discussion as well. You know, Justin Dean's been a solid outfielder. Uh, he's had some moments in spring training. Ryan Castile's probably your backup first baseman uh, at the minor league level right now. Hoy Park, Danny Hetcheria, some other infield options as well. So I've really been in, impressed with the the depth for, from the Braves in spring training so far, and, and it's really kind of given me hope for the team this upcoming season, or it's really helped me feel better about the team this upcoming season with some of that depth. Now, uh, I apologize. I did not get to clip some of the Twitter responses beforehand. So I'm just going to read these off to you from Twitter. But I asked um, which player is set to improve the most from last year and which player is set to regress the most. John Seeley says, I think Olsen improves drastically and not just because of the shift. Second year with the team, less pressure, knows the National League pitchers better now. Um, players that move leagues almost always see improvement from year one to year two. I think Kyle Wright regresses the most, um, but is still uh, a decent starter. I would agree with both of those. Talked about Matt Olson. I think he's going to be better in year two. And I've I mentioned all year, I think there's a chance that Kyle Wright takes a small step back because of the, the shift rules going away. Steve Lamb says, most improvement, Rosario. Again, nowhere to go but up for Rosario. And then regress, he says, Riley. Um I don't know. I, I think Riley is what he is at this point. I think he's going to have peaks and valleys throughout the season. Talked a lot in that behind the scenes episode about being more consistent through the year. So hopefully we see that. But I just think Riley is what he is. I think he's an 820 to 850 OPS player. And I think he'll be around that range again. Gabriel Bonilla says Acuna is going to improve the most, winning most improved player. He can put up 2019 numbers again if he's healthy. Regress could be Riley or Darno if he's not getting the same at bats as last year. I think that's key for Darno. I don't know which way he's going to go. I don't know if this new role for him helps or hurts him at the plate, and that's something we're going to have to see. Um, Cavs Buckeyes says improve Acuna, um, though I'm not sure getting back to form counts as improving. I think it does. I also said Olsen and Ozzy are other picks for improving. And then regressing Harris, left-handed pitching will be an issue, and Babbitt will go down. Uh, Large Lars says Olsen's going to be a monster this year, way more comfortable, and the spotlight isn't directly on him. Uh, hope I'm wrong, but MH2 might regress some, uh, being his second year and pitchers having film on him. So a lot of you coming in with Michael Harris regressing. And look, 
Michael Harris regressing isn't it, it's not a bad thing necessarily. I still think if he regresses from an 850 OPS to a upper 700, 780, 790 OPS, still a really good player. Uh, Key Lime Lacroix says um, Eddie, as far as an improvement type player. Um, as well, and I think I think that's certainly somebody to look at. David Searles says the same thing. Eddie Rosario to progress, Kyle Wright to regress. Um, you know, specifically was focusing on the offense. We'll talk about pitching tomorrow, and Kyle Wright will probably be in that regress discussion. Corey Slovich says Rosario to improve, Harris to regress. Uh, Jordan Griffey says most improved batter will be Rosario or Acuna, and regress will be Travis Darno or Harris. So. It, all of you pretty much on the same page as I am talking about Harris and TDA being those who could regress while, um, you know, Acuna, Olsen, Albies being guys who might improve in 2023. Um, all right, next I want to look at Tuesday's game. Bryce Elder on the mound uh, had another solid performance, keeping his name in that fifth starter mix, and the offense actually absolutely exploded against Philadelphia. And then also get to some of your chat comments as well. All right, the game on Tuesday was just absolutely a laugher. Unfortunately, the Phillies pitcher uh, got blew up, or I shouldn't say unfortunately got it blew up. I think there may have been an injury in there is the reason I said unfortunately. Um, but the Braves offense was just on fire. 15 runs, 15 hits, 11 walks, but 13 strikeouts, which is just kind of crazy with an offensive performance like that. And they still struck out 13 times. But again, that's what this offense is built to do. Hit a lot of home runs, hit for power, but they're going to strike out. Uh, Ozzy had a three-run homer. I mentioned the grand slam by Adrianza. Grissom, Ozuna, Pilar, and Hilliard all had two hits. So Pilar and Hilliard, you know, keeping pace in that ever competitive outfield race that ha it has become in spring training where just all of the outfielders are playing well. Bryce Elder was elder to me. Look, I've been very clear on Bryce Elder from the beginning. I think he's a solid fifth starter, and I don't think that he's ever really going to be much more than that. But I feel confident in his ability to go out there and give you five innings, you know, and keep you in the game. You know, he may go five innings, give up three earned, but he's going to keep you in the game and give you a chance as a fifth starter. And I think that's what Bryce Elder is. There's not a lot of upside there, but I feel very comfortable that he reaches his floor, which to me is a fifth starter. And I think it was just more of that on Tuesday. And then Ozuna, showing improvement at the plate. Um, you know, got to give props to him, obviously, when he's doing well. He's five for his last 10, three doubles, a walk, and two strikeouts. So certainly getting better as spring training is going on. Uh, hopefully that will continue. And Nick Anderson pushing for a, a bullpen spot. I mentioned him at the beginning of spring training as somebody that I thought had the potential to become a, a big part of the bullpen. He's certainly, certainly showing that in spring training. Five innings, four hits, no walks, very key two earned runs and 10 strikeouts and the three, three of the hits he gave up and two of the runs he gave up came in one outing. So the other four outings, he's allowed just one hit, no walks and no earned runs. So he's been very impressive in spring training. Just looking at the stuff, it doesn't look quite like the dominant Nick Anderson that was with the Rays in 2019, but still a guy who can be a setup type reliever at the back of the bullpen. So I don't know if there's a spot for him. It could be an Eli, Eli White situation as well where the Braves just have to stash him until a spot opens up to just keep that depth and to keep from losing somebody else. Uh, but I think Nick Anderson has certainly proven that he's capable of being in a big league bullpen once again and being a big part of that bullpen. All right, to get to some of the chat questions here, I apologize yesterday. I did not realize uh, that I had chat comments turned off. So I know a lot of you were asking after the live stream. So apologize to all those who are on the live stream uh, Monday night uh, that I had comments turned off. I was not aware of that until it was over. Uh, Kwame says Ozuna is raking right now, 120 WRC plus this season with 30 plus home runs. Again, is he capable of doing it? Yes. Do I have much hope for him doing it? No, but uh, somebody else mentioned this. I don't know if it was in the, comments on the the live show or if it was on uh, comments on YouTube but somebody said there's nobody else on the roster 
you know, at that point that will play either left field or DH that's capable of doing what Ozuna can do when he's at his best. And that's absolutely true. When Ozuna's at his best, you know, it can be a 250, 260 hitter with 30 home runs, 90 to 100 RBIs. We've seen that. And when he's at his best, that's what he can be. And, you know, Kevin Pillar's not going to give you that. Eli White's not going to give you that. Sam Hilliard's not going to give you that. Jordan Luplo's not going to give you that. Eddie Rosario is not going to give you that. Ozuna is the only one capable of producing that type of line. I, I will certainly agree with that. Do I think he will get there again? I don't, but I understand those who are still believing in the upside of what he can be. Um, hey, Matthew, thanks so much for joining the stream. Um, didn't I tell you Shoemaker was a top 10 pr prospect? I know I told somebody. Um, not sure if you told me or not, but if you did, good call on that. I had certainly given up on Shoemaker as being a top 10 prospect in the Braves system. Always kind of pegged him as a utility player. And look, it's 20, 25 at bats in spring training. But the one thing that I did not realize, just because I don't watch every game of in the minor league level, unfortunately, and when I do go back and watch games, I'm typically watching mostly at bats because it's hard to sit there and, and wait for a play to be made defensively. So one thing I was not aware of is how great of a defender he has become. And that's pretty apparent in what you see in spring training, that he has become a really good defender at a primary position. And if that's something that you know I had been aware of watching him, I certainly would have had more hope for him because now if the bat does come around and you have a elite defender, then you got something there. Um, so, yeah, great call by you, Matthew. Shoemaker definitely deserves to still be, you know, in the top 10 somewhere in the Atlanta Braves prospect uh, in, in, in their system. William Fulgham says, so it's going to be Dodd or Schuster to start with. Possibly. It all depends on, on Kyle Wright. Um, if Kyle Wright's not ready to go in that second series of the year, then I think maybe we see Dodd or Schuster get an opportunity I still think Ian Anderson and Bryce Elder might lead that competition just because they have the experience there. But Dodd and Schuster have certainly been impressive in spring training. Would not be surprising at all to see either one of them break camp in the rotation, especially, again, if Kyle Wright is delayed. Um, CJ LaChapelle says, Albies is somebody to improve this upcoming season. William Fulgham again says, with Elder and Anderson being um, assigned to Gwinnett don't look good for them to be uh, the fifth starter. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, they – Anderson hasn't shown anything to me that shows there is improvement going on for him. And, um, and I apologize because this is somewhat breaking news. I did not know this when I started the podcast, but you're right, William, so thanks for saying this. Um, the Braves have optioned Bryce Elder and Ian Anderson um, – putting the fifth starter competition between Dodd and Schuster. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of, I guess, breaking news on here. I've been away uh, from the house for quite a while, so I did not realize this. Um, but that is some some pretty big news there, and I don't know why they're doing this so early in camp. But for me, Bryce Elder, he hasn't done anything that I didn't already know he could do. I think Bryce Elder is a solid fifth starter, and if the Braves wanted to put him in that role, I'd be fully comfortable with that, but there's more upside with Dodd. There's more upside with Schuster. I even think there's more upside still with Ian Anderson and obviously Soroka. I mean, if you were asking me who would be better of those five, I would rank Bryce Elder last, but I think he's a safe bet. Um, the Ian Anderson demotion, that to me is surprising. Um I do think Ian Anderson still has things he needs to work on. Uh, I comment commented on it the last time he was out. It just seemed like the same Ian Anderson to me who struggles with command and with that fastball not working, um, you know, teams are spitting on that changeup. He gets himself in a lot of trouble. So I, I guess it's not all that surprising when you really think about it. Uh, but Dodd and Schuster have certainly, you know, earned the opportunity and I still think if if Bright's not ready, then we'll probably see either Bryce Elder or Ian Anderson. I just think Ian Anderson needs more time at AAA. He didn't really show much improvement when he went down to AAA last year. I don't think spring training we've seen much improvement. He still has things he needs to work on. 
but I still believe if he can put it together, it's a guy who can be a middle of rotation arm. Elder is what he is. You know, he's going to be a fifth starter. Um, but a bold move by the Braves here for sure. Uh, going with either Dodd or Schuster, who again have both been very impressive. And we still have a couple of weeks left in camp. And if you're asking me to pick between those two right now, Schuster or Dodd, I see, you know, I see Mark Bowman saying looks like Schuster will get the job. That seems like the likely um, pick just because Schuster's a little older. He spent more time at triple a. So he's a little bit ahead of Dodd in that regard. So I would say Schuster is probably the safe bet to win the fifth starter job right now. Um, additionally, the Braves also reassigned Brian Moran, Drake Baldwin, uh, Joe Dunnan, Adani Hedgeberia, Justin Dean, Cody Milligan, uh, Magnier Sierra, and Forrest Wall to minor league camp. So Forrest Wall gets option um, as he's had a great spring training. Again, just some really solid depth there. But yeah, that's pretty big news. So I'm glad uh, you mentioned that, William, in the comments because I did not see that. Uh, I just ran in home and jumped on the computer real quick. So that's some pretty big uh, news to talk about. And we're going to talk about the pitching tomorrow. So I'll probably go into more detail on it then but it looks like the fifth starters job is down to dot and schuster with schuster likely being the fra the favorite blake newsom says will jake go 12 and 0 on the show before soroka is back and amped to shove i've never gone 12 and 0 in the show before in battle royale so i think soroka is probably a safe bet there i hope so um you know i hope he's back you know i would be more happy if he's back and pitching like soroka than me going 12 and 0 and Battle Royale on the show. Uh, Blake also said, if Azuna is back, then cool. Um, let's trade him before he reverts back. And yeah, maybe that's part of the strategy too. Azuna gets off to a hot start, and then you try uh, to trade him. CJ LaChapelle says, what's the latest news on Soroka? I talked about this, I think, on this Twitch stream the other night. We've heard almost nothing on Soroka for what feels like a week or so. Uh, very odd. Um you know, I don't know where we are on Soroka. That's a great question. Nobody's really said anything lately, so that makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, Blake Newsom, Elder looked a lot better than Ian, to be honest. I still think he gets the five. Well, they did just option him, so he's kind of out of that battle right now. I would agree with you, though. Elder's looked better than Anderson. Um, he just has, you know, Elder has the same issues, too, though. His stuff moves all over the place. He has to be in the zone in it, even on – Tuesday's game, Elder was falling behind in the count a lot. Uh, hey, Chris, what's up? Thanks for joining. How excited are you for the show 23? What do you think are the chances of getting a Braves player as a cover athlete? That's a good question. I am certainly excited about the show 23. They're going to be introducing uh, the Negro League storylines this year. And for that alone, I would buy this game as I think that's going to be a great way to kind of get introduced if you're not familiar with it into the Negro League. So certainly would advise you to not to buy the game, but at least become more familiar with the Negro Leagues. I think it's a big part of not just baseball history, but American history. And I think if there's anybody, you, you think at least, you look at some of the past cover athletes like Jazz Chisholm this year, Javier Baez, um, you know, if anybody from the Braves is going to get it, Acuna seems like the safe bet. If he were to bounce back this year and have a monster season, win MVP, I could see him being the cover athlete next year. Uh, Blake Newsom, how many of these Gwinnett depth names will will we have to dump waivers at the end of March? That's a good question. I think about guys like Magnier uh, Sierra, you know, even Kevin Pilar, if he didn't make the team, you know, I know that he's on a minor league option, but, um, you know, as long as these guys have options, they can stash them, but you can only put so many people at Gwinnett. So I'm sure they're going to have to lose some of these. Uh, Brenda Grace, what is Ian's trade value at this point? It's very low. It's as low as it's ever going to be, be. There's almost no point in trading Ian Anderson right now. Send him back to AAA. Again, if he can work, you know, continue to work on things, work on his mechanics, his command, work on that slider and that curveball. And I, I think he can still come back and be a very good pitcher. Jeffrey Humphreys, Travis may surprise everyone and pick up his game with having Sean Murphy as a great example of premium defense. Surely it can't hurt Travis's game. Competition is good for the team. And, and TDA is already a great defensive player behind the play. He doesn't have the best arm. That's the only area he's lacking. I just don't know how it's going to affect his offense. Um, all right, that's going to do it for this episode. Gone a little long here, but we kind of had that news late in the episode I didn't know about. I'll cover it more tomorrow when we preview the Braves pitching for the upcoming season. Uh, so make sure that you 
tune in for that. Thank you all so much for joining. I started this stream really late as I've been out of the house for a while. So I appreciate you jumping on live with me and listening. As always, thank you so much for those listening to the replay, whether on YouTube or on a podcast audio. I uh, do appreciate all the support. Thanks for making Lockdown Braves your first listen of each and every day. Now go make your second listen to Lockdown MLB Prospects podcast, where host Lindsey Crosby is talking about the biggest and brightest stars of tomorrow. Again, thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. You can follow me at Shortstop Ball. Also follow me on Twitch at Shortstop Ball, where I'll be streaming MLB the show and doing some watch parties along with you for Braves games during the year. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.